Und jetzt habe ich noch eine Improvisation für Sie vor. Aber ich denke, das wird, äh, das wird äh, auch klappen, dass wir virtuell zusammenkommen. Nämlich äh, in unserer überforderten äh, Welt äh, der äh, ökologischen äh, Instabilitäten hatte es in den USA so geschneit, dass die Flugzeuge nicht geflogen sind. Und deswegen also ist vor so gestern fast kein Flugzeug. Die ganz transatlantische Flugzeuge sind ausgefallen. Und wir haben natürlich unsere nächste Referent, das ist Professor Hassan Elai von Bangladesch und den USA. Er wird hoffentlich per Skype jetzt mit uns seinen Vortrag halten. Der gläserne Mensch über totale Transparenz im Zeitalter der NSA-Überwachung. Das Thema dürfte eigentlich nicht fehlen, oder? Und deswegen hoffe ich, dass das wirklich jetzt ähm, klappt. Ähm, ich denke auch natürlich, dass Hassan Elai ist ein äh, bekannter Person. Äh, wir, ich verrate nichts, das soll er selbst machen. Er ist Medienkünstler und Direktor des Zentrums Digital Cultures and Creativity Honors College at the Universität Maryland. Und jetzt, ich weiß, wir haben schon geprobt, geprobt und jetzt drücken Sie uns allen den Daumen, dass es jetzt klappt. Hey, uh, hello everyone. Uh, apologies for not being able to be there in person. Uh, we're having a little bit of a weather issue here and we've had uh, thousands of flight cancellations and I got to the airport last night and they said, no, uh, there's no way you're getting out tonight. So uh, let, me, let me share my screen and let me know if you can actually see this. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to see this. Uh, do you see yourself there, screen? Okay, great. So let me just show you a little bit. So this is me and this arrow will make a little bit more sense in a little bit. So I'm just gonna give you the very quick three minute intro or the two minute intro about this project that I've been doing for the last uh, one quarter of my life. So a, a while ago, uh, let me go over here. So uh, this is the Detroit airport, an aerial view of this. And uh, I was taken into custody with the uh, government and actually I was met by an FBI agent at this airport who questioned me about my whereabouts of where I was, who I was with, pays for my bills, why, why, you know, what kind of art I make, every little detail. And uh, they asked me about a peculiar situation about where were you September 12th? And most of us don't normally have things of when, when, when were you at this point or that point or that point. So on the 12th, I paid my storage bill, I met with the student, then I taught my classes. So, so we read my calendar for months, several months at a time, over and over and over. And uh, if you notice this thing about the pay storage, the 10 to 10.30, this becomes very important because uh, during the, during the uh, uh, questioning, he asked me, what did you have in that storage? Which, by the way, would be this storage, bit number J3, at, uh, I think it's called USA Storage now. It used to be called something else at the time. It has a very patriotic name now. So, uh, they, uh, you know, the, the FBI asked me, what was in there? What, what did you have? And I'm thinking, well, I know, uh, I don't know, winter clothes, just, uh, and this is Florida, so you don't really need winter clothes. Uh, or just junk, uh, useless, useless things. And uh, he looks very confused and asks me, no explosives. Because they had received a report that an Arab man had fled on September 12th who was hoarding explosives. Oh, never mind, I'm not Arab. This is a complete miscategorization. This is a misidentification of race and what you're expected to. So if you're dark, well, I'm South Asian, I'm Bengali. So you expect us to, I, think, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think from Bengal to uh, the Middle East might be the same distance as the Middle East to where I am right now. I mean, it's, they're not exactly the same, but we have a general sense of really understand race and identity, and so it's a very clear us and them. Either us or it's them, and the them is much easier to ob together. And, and also, you have to remember in the US, we have this culture of if you see something, say something, and even if you just only see it in your head and you're making it up. So 
uh, what happens in this case is that so even though I'm not Arab, but I'm, I'm dark, so therefore uh, I must be one of them. And then I have this name, which is this Muslim name. And if you have a Muslim name, then you must be Arab because there's no other way this fits in the system. And if you're Arab, then you must be a terrorist. You must have explosives. This is the logic we're dealing with, and this is, this is the system that we've, uh, we've trapped ourselves into, into thinking about this uh, global war on terror. So I went back to Florida. I think you know, the, the agent that was uh, questioning me realized that I was completely harmless and I was not a threat at all. So they uh, let me go home, phone rang. Uh, I'm, uh, anyway, long story short, I spent six months of my life going in and out of this particular building. Uh, this happens to be the federal building in downtown Tampa, and uh, this is a better view of it. And uh, this is, I, I love this picture because for the longest time in the U.S., you could not take photographs of federal buildings. But thanks to Google, uh, those photographs are already being taken. So there was an entire database of every image that you're not allowed to take. So thank you, Google. Anyway. So uh, at, the end of nine, at the end of six months, I was uh, told everything was OK after nine consecutive polygraphs. And I was like, I know everything's OK. That's what I've been trying to tell you all, all along. I know I'm OK. Uh, and, what I, and I said, guys, uh, I travel a lot. And all we need is the last person at the last airport not to get this updated memo. And here we go all over again. How do we avoid this? And at that moment, that's when the FBI said, well, here's some phone numbers. If you get into trouble, we'll take care of it. Oh, so I figured, hey, I got the best, uh, I have the security guys in the business. These are the great bodyguards. I mean, even Hollywood celebrities don't have people like this. So I decided to uh, create this little, so, okay, so I should, I should start off by saying that I would call and then I would tell my FBI agent where I was going, what I was doing. Uh, I give them flight numbers, it's, and, and you have to remember, it's not that I had to, but I voluntarily chose to. I wanted to make sure that the FBI knew that I wasn't going off, running off somewhere, or that I wasn't going to be hiding. It's like, look, I, I, I want you to know, this is exactly where I'm going, and I'd give them my flight numbers, and he would always be very polite, he says, thank you, be safe. And I would send those phone calls, and emails, and the emails got really, really, really long. Uh, I would write thousands of words to him, describing every little detail. I would tell him tips on which bars to go to in Bangkok, or you know, which, which uh, noodle place in Tokyo was really good, and which neighbor to go get the best uh, uh, Taiwanese beef, beef noodle soup. And uh, he would always write back, thank you. Be safe. So it was a very unbalanced relationship. You know, you've ever had those kinds of situations where you, you, you're talk, you think you're really connecting with someone and you're telling them your whole, you're opening your heart and telling them everything and they're just like, yeah, yeah, whatever, kind of, yeah. Yeah, I acknowledge you're talking to me, but I'm not really going to respond in any other way. It was one of those and I felt kind of, uh, maybe not heartbroken is the right word, but I was disappointed. I was disappointed that the FBI did not reciprocate to the level that I wanted to provide. So I decided to create this. Let me show you a live demo of it because I think it'll be easier. So what you're looking at here, uh, this, is, this is my office right here. Uh, this is where I'm sitting. You, you can see it looks like a campus a building over here with the scroll image across the top. You can zoom in a little bit. You can see what's going on. You can go way in and see what's happening. I'm, I'm in that part of the building right now. Uh, and you can zoom out and you can see there's a large city over here, which happens to be Washington, D.C. Dulles Airport is over here. Baltimore is up there and there's some body of water over here. Uh, anyway, so when I first started doing this project, it was very odd seeing yourself as a pixel, uh, this flashing arrow. And these days, it, we don't even think about this. Ten years later, uh, this is such a different way of looking at ourselves as a pixel. So. Uh, let me go back to this image over here. So what's happening is, back in the old days, old days meaning, well, say, 10 years ago, we would have to open up a roadmap. We would have to unfold that map. 
and we would go, we are here, and you would have to locate yourself within that map. So you would have to place yourself within the geography, within the context, within the, within the physical location or the, represent, or the map representation of the physical location. In this case now, I just pull out my magic phone out of my pocket and I hit a little blue button and it tells me exactly where I am and I become the center of my map. This kind of a cultural relationship to our geography, I think, is very crucial in understanding this digitization and looking at ourselves, not necessarily, not necessarily looking at ourselves as a physical body in space, but a data body. We're all creating these data doppelgangers. So what you're basically watching here is this constant feed of everything that I've, I've documented my life every few moments, and I share all of this with the FBI because, you know, if the FBI needs to know. They need to know exactly every little detail of what I'm doing. So, but I'm giving you these images that are sort of anonymous, but they're incredibly specific, and you don't really know what you're looking at. And sometimes, well, it could be there, but if you've been in this building, if you've been in my office, this place could only be this. Let me switch back and show you what I'm talking about. So if you look in the image, uh, okay, so if you just saw that image, and if you look over there, that's that space right there. So this space that, that I'm showing you, this image with this, uh, what, this what really could be any office of any kind of uh, piles of books in the corner and boxes it could only be that one spot in that corner of the room. So there's a real hyper-specificity, even though I'm giving you a very general image, the specificity to that one image could only be this particular spot. This is where my body has been located. But you never actually interact with me and my body and my, and my image as myself, but you're dealing with my information. So what you're really interacting with is my information doppelganger. Uh, and we, are all, we all have one. We all have a digital body. And our digital bodies have more interaction with each other than our physical bodies. And I think as we, as we move into a world and an economy where it's more and more dematerialized, you know, our, our society, I mean, we're no longer agrarian society farming in general, where our economies are no longer based on industry where we make good goods and we manufacture uh, uh, big machinery and such. Now our entire economies are based on knowledge and service. These are completely immaterial, non-tangibles. So as, as more and more things move to becoming data, I think the data body becomes really important. So let me go back to this so you can see uh, a little bit more of what, what else is happening. So in this, in this work over here, you're getting this continuous feed of images of every type of image. And in a way, what I'm doing is I'm telling you everything and I'm telling you nothing simultaneously. I'm giving you so much information that I'm actually pretty anonymous. I'm, I live an incredibly anonymous and private life. And, and when I give you information, it's so cryptic and that there, it requires such a level of analysis. If you have no idea what happened in that bed, you have no idea who I was there with, you have no idea why I was there, but it just looks like a messy bed. Or this one, which looks like a shopping mall, is actually an airport in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. But I know that, and if you've been to that airport, you would recognize that. So there's all these specific points, and there's about 70,000 points that are being distributed all over. I even shared the toilets with my FBI. <laughs> it's very important for them because what I feel about, hey, FBI, you want to watch? okay with that but I can watch myself way better than you ever could and I could get such a level of detail that you'll never have access to and this is what, exactly what's happening we're all generating all this data we're creating all of these things so so in a in a way we're living in a we're, we're actually create uh, well in this case in my case I'm creating data camouflage and I'm actually hiding within the camouflage. Uh, or another way to put it, it's hide plain sight. So one of the things 
So one of the things that happens in this hiding in plain sight is that historically, when you think of camouflage, you know, when you think of the, the soldiers and the, and the patterns of the, of the leaves and the trees and the bushes, that camouflage was required so the enemy could not distinguish between the, the soldier trees or the soldier in the bushes. So when you would shoot, you didn't know what you were shooting at. In the same way, in this data, there's so much noise and so much camouflage. My private life is completely camouflaged within all this other evidence and data. As autobiographic as it is, it may not actually have much value in terms of data and information, particularly when you're trying to figure out intention and emotion and uh, thoughts. Evidence, but you're not necessarily getting uh, valuable information, because that part I'm actually keeping to myself. Uh, and, and never do you actually see who I'm interacting with. You know I'm interacting with people, but you have no idea who they are. You know that I'm, I probably spend a lot of time in empty spaces because I probably don't like people, but you have no idea of knowing this. But really, let's go back to the idea of camouflage. If you look at what the current U.S. soldiers are wearing in their camouflage, that camouflage is actually pixels. If you look very closely, it's, it's actually inkjet printed. And that, and that camouflage pattern is, and, and if you look at the color, look at the pattern of the color. It's greenish, grayish, uh, kind of beigeish, whitish. There's no trees anywhere that color. There, not a, there's not no single tree anywhere in the world that particular color. But what has happened is we no longer have a need for the soldier to blend into the landscape of the warfare but now we need the soldier to blend into the machinery, or very specifically, the need for the soldier, for the enemy, to not be able to distinguish between the soldier and the noise from the night vision goggles. So there's an embodiment of warfare, an embodiment of the technology of war, that is absolutely uh, a huge cultural shift that's taking place today that did not exist 10, 15, 20 years ago. So I think as we're, again, going back to this idea of the dematerialization of data and of how this data moves back and forth, it's become that much more important. So in another way that, that I'm also presenting, let me uh, go, go back over here so, so we'll, we'll throw a few more images on. So another thing that's happening over here, uh, as I'm giving you all of this, it, the, the images that you're really looking at, you're almost getting this idea of a, of a panopticon or the reversal of the panopticon where historically the soldier would be in, uh, the, the guard would be in the middle and the prisoners would be on the outside. But if there's so much stimulus and so, much, so many of these prison points reversed and the mirror is held up, uh, there's no way for the guard, or in this case the FBI, to make sense and get a cohesive read on this many thousands and thousands of pieces of data. So I have a firm belief that the way you counter this type of surveillance and this kind of watching is that you join in and you throw in information into that database and you, and you take control over it. And I think by opting in, that is the ultimate form of power, the ultimate way of changing this. Now, let me go back over here because I want to show you a couple of other things. So. I'm not sure if you can actually see this next image of, of the text, but these are all the people that come by and see my, uh, they come by by my website all the time. And um, I mean, there's not actually, I mean, I created a better, a cleaner list so you can see, uh, you can see the executive office of the president, you can see the Army Intelligence Central Online Network, you can see the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. You can see the Central Intelligence Agency. I don't know why they come by. <coughs> uh, is that uh, they come by with alarming frequency, not as much as now in the Obama administration, but certainly during the Bush administration, these folks came by with alarming frequency to the point where I actually was thinking, why in the world do they want to come and look at? But I'm glad all of the uh, agencies, and most of them are based in Washington, D.C., that they do appreciate the arts, and they do appreciate 
this type of uh, visual uh, language and visual culture. So a couple of, and so I have to give thanks to a very important person, because if it wasn't for this man, none of this would be ever be possible. And it was really his ideas that uh, that really triggered this. And uh, so I have to, I have to thank him. And a few years ago, I uh, saw uh, I joined the University of Maryland. And when I say university, and this is where I am right now. When I say University of Maryland, most people often think we're in Baltimore, at least in the U.S., but we're actually inside the Beltway. This is the, you know, the Washington Beltway that you hear about. And let me zoom out a little bit. Uh, so this is where we are in the middle of the, in the middle of the, uh, uh, in, in the Beltway. This is, this is where it's going around. This is the, this is the FBI headquarters uh, in, in Washington, D.C. This is the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. And this is the NSA headquarters at Fort Meade, Maryland. When you triangulate all three of these agencies, ends up on this patch of land sitting in today at the office. This literally triangulates the middle of our campus. So I'm actually, uh, I love living here. Washington is a very unique place and it's a great place. But one thing I have to say is real estate is extremely expensive. Uh, and, and so I've been looking for houses and I've been trying to find how to think. I have to keep in mind that I, I monitor myself at all times. So wherever I go, uh, there's a map and an arrow pointing to where I'm going. So I've been driving around a lot looking for houses. And I found this patch of land. Uh, this is in uh, St. Michael's, Maryland, the other side of the bay. It's about an hour, hour and 45 minute drive, depending on traffic. And this is where it's at. And if you look in, uh, it's, an, it's an irregular shape. But you notice there's a really nice uh, driveway across the street. I mean, this is a very fancy neighborhood. Uh, there's another house over here at the end. And this house happens to belong to this, this same man. So I won't live next to him. And uh, by, by me, continuously putting myself under surveillance also puts him under surveillance. So it's a way of reverse this, really holding the mirror up and, and embracing him and say, hey, come on, let's join in, let's monitor ourselves. Let me show you a little bit around the neighborhood. So, oh, by the way, his, his friend, Doc uh, Rumsfeld, lived up the street uh, a few houses away. And uh, that, that, that circle at the top is, is Rumsfeld's house. Anyway, going back to my house and uh, Dick Cheney's house, or my proposed house that I'm about to build, or I'd like to build, uh, let me show you around the neighborhood. This is the, the, this is the entryway. This is the driveway into the house. This is his garage. He has a five-car garage there. This is his swimming pool. Uh, this is, he likes wisteria. I think he likes these flowers there. He has a beautiful garden. This is his kitchen. Oh, by the way, you remember that undisclosed location you would hear that Dick Cheney would get taken to? This is it. 7879 Fuller Drive, St. Michael's, Maryland, 21663. So uh, this is where he sleeps. This is where, he, uh, this is where Darth Vader sleeps. This is his front room. And this is the attic where we're going to sit and plot world domination. Uh, but, and this is what I'm planning on, uh, and this is, uh, this is what I'm planning on building in front of his house. This is where I'm going to be living. <laughs> so, one of the things, so I, I should, I should make it, so I should make it clear that, okay, here's this man who had every possible motivation to remain private. He had every resource in the world to be private. This is not only the former vice president, this is the former CEO of Halliburton. Money is no object to this man. And yet, if I can get this level of information about him, what can he get about us? What can companies that specialize in this, what do nations that have unlimited resources into our private lives, what can they know about us? I'm completely self-trained in this. I'm, I'm not a cybersecurity expert. I'm not a computer scientist. 
I'm an artist, and if I can get this information, what can they get about us? So what I'm basically, I'd like to end it off today by saying is that our ideas of what we thought about privacy and what we thought about information and protection of that information, it, we have to change our frame of reference and our frame of mind on how we treat this. What we thought was normal before is no longer going to be normal tomorrow. The rules of yesterday simply will not apply to tomorrow. Uh, it's not a matter of better or worse. It's a matter of something being completely different, and we have to be ready to adapt this as it changes. So thank you very much, and I would love to take some questions.